Okay, the first part of my talk would be would be about uh, space time activity that we design, and actually just uh, in the second part I would do a comparison with the space time activity and fast. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, Michael Minium that had me as a visitor research at the Berkeley Lab. And uh, so thank you. Sure, if, if you're there, and let's proceed. So. Um, the, the approach I'm, uh, I'm following can be called space time or also all at once. And uh, if I can do a very short introduction, this is what I would say. So if you have any kind of evolutionary problem, let's say where you want to evaluate UK, where K is your time step, you may end up with this kind of uh, equation here. And uh, for example, if you're using an explicit method A would be just the identity, identity matrix. And what you would usually do is uh, uh, in a sequential approach would be just to solve this kind of equation here where you compute A to the minus one. And so time step after time steps, you compute your UK plus one. But in the all at once approach or in the space time approach, uh, um, you assemble this kind of bi-diagonal system that we saw many times uh, during the conference. And uh, now all the problem of parallelized in space and also in time is shifted to an algebraic parallelization of uh, the solver for this linear system. So this is just a broad introduction now. I will talk more in details about the problem and the discretization. So the problem that I uh, trying to solve is a nonlinear reaction diffusion equation. Uh, so it's the same as the equation, but you have a reaction term here. And uh, this one in particular uh, can be framed as a monodomain model. And uh, it's used uh, if you use, for example, a reaction of this kind, uh, that it's a cubic term reaction with three uh, equilibrium point. One is in Two are stable and one is not stable. And this can be used to model excitable media and waves uh, spreading in excitable media. And uh, for example, I find my the application comes from the spreading of the electrical signal in the art. So uh, an application from uh, electrophysiology. And for A equals zero, uh, you get uh, standard linear diffusion equation. We will look also at this one, of course. And uh, if you want a um, real realistic 3D simulation of a monodomain model, it can become very extensive computationally, as you have to use at least uh, uh, one million degrees of freedom in space to resolve your heart mesh and uh, thousands at least of time steps per uh, heartbeat. So this can become very easily more than billions uh, of unknown. And of course, this needs a lot of parallelization. Uh, now I'll show you just some movies. Uh, this is just a plain diffusion, very boring. So you start from something like this and diffuse. Then uh, we add the reaction term. This is very similar of what I saw uh, in the past days in other talks, but with other names like Allen, Kahn, and Kahn Hillard equation. So, if uh, your equilibrium points are the same, I mean, the same amplitude, in this case, minus one and uh, plus one, you end up with this situation where the solution goes or to minus or plus one. And uh, the curvature is uh, getting smaller. Then, uh, for example, you put more reaction and less diffusion, you get something like this, where things are not diffusing a lot around. And, uh, you can have, if you introduce an asymmetry in the coefficients, in the equilibrium point, let's say you can get this spreading of the wave. So if you start with the stimulus here, you have a, a, a spreading that can model, for example, an excitable media. And uh, for the monodomain, you also need to add other, uh, uh, other ODEs, and these uh, are responsible for the depolarization after uh, depolarization. So you have kind of a more a wave uh, looking uh, simulation. And this can uh, 
um, can produce very interesting dynamics as the spiral wave that you see here. So you have an impulse and then you have, uh, let's say, a stimulus here and this can produce uh, self-sustaining waves. And these are very interesting for the studies of the heart pathologies that uh, are related with heart attacks and stuff like this. So um, getting back to the math, um, I had uh, the reaction diffusion equation and I discretized with the tensor discretization in space and time. So this is, uh, these are my basis function and I use finite element uh, in space. I'm not giving many details about the discretizations, but it's finite element in space uh, and uh, this continuous galeric is also finite element in time. And uh, finally, I discretize uh, my equation and I get a system like this, as we, see, we saw before. And if you look at the heat equation here, um, you can uh, uh, write down the operators A and B very easily in terms of stiffness matrix in space and in time and tensor product between them because you have a tensor uh, product of uh, the space the spatial mesh and the time mesh, you find the same structure, let's say algebraically. So you have this tensor product of operators in time with the T here and space. This is, for example, it's a mass matrix in space and this is a stiffness in space. And this is a coupling term coming from the discontinuous gallery in time. So this is um, the final form of your system. And uh, what are some pros and cons of this uh, discretization in space-time? Uh, as I said, it, it enables uh, full parallelism quite easily because you just have to solve in parallel uh, a linear system. So, and also you have space-time adaptivity that can be somehow enabled because the dynamics of our problems are restricted to a very small portion of the domain. So this could be very interesting for this application. Also, you have uh, moving domains. Uh, here I have a question mark because uh, if the domain is moving in a way that you know a priori, then that's good. If you, for example, have some rotors uh, or a cylinder in a fluid, that, that makes sense. But for the heart application, you don't know the movement of the heart because this would be uh, triggered by the solution of the monodomain model. So, for, for this application, the moving domains is not really a point. And other drawbacks are that you, uh, you have to solve a large linear system, so with high memory footprint, and for this you have to invest at least in uh, many processors and distribute your problem, your metrics among them. And also that for the unstructured mesh are not available, so you are limited to use tensor product approach, as far as I know, or uh, yeah, simple grids. So if you uh, now consider the space-time system that I introduced before and we call this uh, C, we can also define a discretization parameter, mu. That's, this one depends from delta t and delta x and from the diffusion coefficient. And this comes uh, naturally uh, from the discretization because you have a first derivative in time and a second one in space. And uh, you, can, uh, you can measure your uh, convergence, uh, the convergence of various solvers and the condition number, uh, depending on mu. For example, here I plot the condition number of the space-time matrix depending on mu, and you can see uh, it has a sharp minimum, and this corresponds to a uh, similar behaving, uh, let's say, in, uh, in the performance of various iterative solvers here. Here you have a bunch of iterative solvers and all have uh, a minimum in the convergence factor, uh, something here between uh, mu 10 to the minus two and one. Uh, and this, we were able to explain this behavior in terms of the spectrum of our space-time operators. So C, this is uh, spectrally equivalent, so meaning that uh, has the same eigenvalue uh, of A under uh, some not mild as some mild assumption and uh, this a um, is spectrally equivalent again to this linear combination of a mass matrix and a stiffness matrix and with uh, some uh, simple computation you can uh, you can uh, 
C. Uh, you, you can compute exactly this condition number, like you can compute uh, uh, where the minimum is, and for example, uh, for uh, Q equals one, this is the order in time, and P one is the order in space, the finite element order. This is uh, one over six, and you can generalize this for different orders. And uh, instead from uh, uh, talking about the space-time math grid um, that I use to solve the space-time system, uh, for, as smoothing, I use black Jacobi preconditioner, PGM res, and uh, the transfer is quite easy because we are dealing with a tensor product space, so uh, the space time transfer is going to be the uh, tensor product of various transfer. This is a transferring time, this is uh, transferring the time elements, so you can do uh, P multigrid in time, and this is uh, transferring space. And for space coarsening, we adopt this strategy that is quite flexible. So if you have a mesh, it's a semi-geometric strategy, you have uh, this colored mesh here, and you can compute uh, the bounding box, and from this bounding box, you can construct the core spaces automatically. And then you can, um, you can use, for example, L2 projections to uh, construct the transfer operators between the nested, not nested mesh, meshes. And uh, this is well known from the literature, the space-time literature. If you look at the convergence of the space-time multigrid, depending on mu, uh, that is here that have been defined before, and the type of coarsening that you use, this convergence is varying a lot depending on what you use. For example, if you use full space-time coarsening, you have something like this in the blue curve, and uh, time coarsening is this one and the yellow space coarsening. So you have to, let's say, select, uh, for example, adaptively uh, what, uh, what kind of coarsening you want to, to use. And what I can see is that uh, in practice, at least in my application and in every application I've seen before, uh, yeah, this mu is quite large because you have the delta x squared, the denominator. So you are usually are in this region and space coarsening is usually enough. Um, now I present some experiments we do just to validate our semi-geometric approach. So in this kind of mesh, if I compare the, the convergence of the uh, standard multigrid, geometric multigrid and the semi-geometric approach with different kind of interpolation, I see that uh, they are behaving pretty similarly, so kind of the same. So in this respect, uh, the semi-geometric approach is pretty good. But if we go to, uh, let's say, a geometry that is not very well represented by a cube in 3D, for example, things become a little bit uh, more nasty here. For example, the geometric multigrid has five iterations to converges, and these are the run times, so five seconds. And these are the levels. And for the semi-geometric multigrid, if I use, for example, three levels, I get 53 directions. So this is, uh, can be a problem in, for the space-time uh, semi-geometric approach that could still probably be solved. But uh, uh, now it, it's a problem. And uh, here I present some, uh, some numerical experiments concerning the, the heat equation for a 3D geometry with uh, these parameters. This is the finite uh, element order in, time, in space and time. Uh, and uh, here is two levels. And here I vary the number of time steps. And uh, you can see that the, here I have space time coarsening, space coarsening, and this is just an EDU PGM res. And in this case, the space coarsening seems to be always the, the best choice in terms of iterations and, uh, and runtime. Also because we are dealing with a 3D uh, problem that has usually much more degrees of freedom in space. So you always need to coarsening in space. Otherwise your course problem are not going to be very cheap. And if you want to be more precise, you have also to consider the, 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 the fiber direction in the heart. So you're not dealing with a, an isotropic problem, uh, but uh, you have an uh, anisotropy and for example, if we try uh, to incorporate this anisotropy in the diffusion, this is just a picture representing the direction of uh, this is a random anisotropy. 
Also in this case, we can see that the multigrid uh, with respect to the case of a constant diff diffusion, it's, uh, it's suffering a lot. So here you can see the number of iteration, it's very high with respect to, for example, is it 39 for the constant diffusion, here would be the plus than 3000 for, uh, for this anisotropic diffusion. So this is another problem for the real uh, application. And uh, now I was talking about the, the heat equation, but if we go to the full model, so we incorporate also the reaction term and we use realistic parameter for uh, all the parameters in the monodomain model uh, with a fairly large uh, problem, uh, I get this, uh, this run times. And uh, here we are dealing with a nonlinear problem. So we have to use also uh, um, inexact Newton solver for the nonlinear space-time system. And this n here is the number of time steps because you cannot solve this uh, uh, nonlinear space-time system for all the time steps you consider that in this case are I think more than 2000. So you need to uh, divide your space-time domain in smaller uh, space-time blocks where you use just a few uh, number of time steps. Otherwise your uh, Newton is not going to converge. So this is uh, the scenario where I use 32 time steps for every space-time block and here just one. So this is just a standard uh, sequential approach, I would say. And you see that for, for example, four cores, uh, this is much slower, but it scales much better. So when you go to, for example, 4,000 cores, uh, this gets uh, faster than uh, what the best time that you get with the sequential approach. And these are run times or in minutes. Um, now I finally present the comparison with uh, FAST that I think uh, could be very interesting because uh, I mean comparing method uh, it's always good and uh, um, here I, I give different uh, perspective of what FAST is. Uh, one perspective could be to see it as a multi-level parallel with the STC uh, iterative scheme in time both in the fine and the coarse levels, where uh, I, what, what's changing between fine and coarse levels is the, uh, the order of integration. So in this respect, this could be seen also as a P-multi grid in time. And of course, for these reasons, this would be suitable, or let's say designed for high order time discretization. And uh, all my experiments are used uh, with the Fortran library, uh, LibFast that I extend to use Petsy, so that I make, uh, can make, uh, let's say, a fair comparison because I use Petsy for both the space-time multigrid and, uh, and FAST for the data structures and uh, the many routines. So when I compare the two methods, I always consider the same discrete solution. So they actually produce the same thing. As I said, they all use Petsy data structures, routines and solvers, use the same machine, and um, I tried to optimize solver parameters uh, for runtime for both solvers. And in this respect, again, for the space-time multigrid, I used just uh, semi-coarsening in space because this was, uh, I mean, I tried uh, also coarsening in time or p-coarsening in time, but uh, um, in the experiments I've tried, uh, semi-coarsening in space was always the best option. And so, these are the results uh, concerning the strong scaling uh, uh, of, for the heat equation. This is 1D problem, t equals 1, the initial solution uh, is a bunch of cosines. And uh, um, this is the dimension of the space-time grid where uh, m is the number of um, Gauss-Radon nodes for time element. So the order would be 2m minus 1. So for uh, m equals 5, for example, we would have a ninth order method. And uh, I was always consider an accuracy of 10 to the minus 1. That is the same as a solvent tolerance. So that I, let's say, try to not uh, fool myself with the masses with this. And uh, these are the results here. Uh, this is for one uh, M1 and 2, and the, here on the right for M345. Uh, the solid line is the space-time multigrid, and the dashed line is fast. So in general, they are behaving, I would say, quite similarly. 
So this is at least what I say uh, I see from the from the numbers, and uh, here uh, you can see also that uh, if you use um, high order method, you can get some let's say if we speed up here the y axis is the same, but the x axis is not the same. You can get some free speed up just using a high order method, and uh, for the weak scaling. Uh, Again, same uh, same problem. Um, and one, two, you don't get very much of weak scaling, uh, but if you increase the, the order in time, you get for both approaches uh, a quite good uh, weak scaling in time. This is just weak scaling in time. So I increase the number of uh, time steps and uh, at the same time, I increase the number of cores that I use. Um, now, if we go to to the nonlinear uh, problem, so the monodomain, this is where really uh, it get different because for the space time approach, you are solving a full implicit implicit uh, problem with uh, with Newton as nonlinear solvers, and this um, uh, force you to have a lot of overhead. For example, we have Newton iteration that do not scale. So if you increase the number of processor, you don't get less Newton iteration. So this is something that does not scale. Also the Newton iteration convert, uh, depends a lot on uh, problem parameters and uh, on the initial guess. For example, here you can see how the number of Newton iteration uh, I have to use depends on the final time t. And this, uh, if you increase the final time can become uh, uh, pretty rough. Maybe here is also going up. So uh, this, I would say it's an intrinsic problem with the, with the space-time approach. And this is what I also saw in this paper about uh, parallel multigrid solver for incompressible navier stocks. And uh, in this respect, FAST is more flexible because you can choose uh, to treat uh, the reaction term explicitly. And so you get uh, much faster because you can, uh, you get kind of the same uh, the same uh, runtimes that you would get for the heat equation. Instead, for the space time uh, approach, you have uh, uh, let's say at least uh, 15, 20 Newton iteration for the problem I considered, and then you have additional operation for uh, assembling the Jacobian. So you get a factor of 20 in your runtime uh, with respect to the heat equation. So this is more flexible, uh, it's explicit, so it's a little bit less robust, but uh, it's much faster. So now uh, the conclusion, I presented you some uh, study on the conditioning of the space-time system and uh, a semi-geometric gray box uh, space-time multigrid. And we can understand better what, ha uh, what happens in terms of uh, semi-coarsening strategy uh, also considering the, the study of the conditioning of the space-time matrix. And then uh, I did this comparison with FAST and, uh, and uh, yeah, maybe the main point is that for the nonlinear space-time uh, can create problems, sorry. You are limited to use a full implicit approach. And so I thank you for, uh, for your attention. And uh, these are some reference for my talk, this is uh, my PhD thesis, so everything is, uh, should be in there. This is a paper that, where we analyze the, the spectral properties of the space-time system with also IGA um, discretization in space. This is a paper where we focus a little bit more uh, on the IGA discretization to, to make a linear solvent fast. And this is the paper that just, uh, just uh, wrote about the comparison with the uh, fast. Thank you.